Right, good evening everybody and thank you for joining us this evening for the webinar which is being hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Katie Thorley and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on effective use of vaccines. Our presenter this evening is Dr Fiona Lovett from Flock Health Limited. Fiona has worked as a farm vet in practice for many years and set up Flock Health Limited as a consultant about four years ago. The plan of action is Fiona will run through a presentation and then there'll be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if you, anybody would like to ask any questions, then please write it in the box on the right hand side and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. We have over 200 people registered for this evening's webinar and hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties, but if there are, please bear with us. So without further delay, I'll hand you over to Fiona. Great. Thanks, Katie. Um, well, welcome to this webinar. Now, um, I'm going to crack on straight away with it because there's loads to cover and apologies to people. So we've got vets and we've got farmers in this audience and I know there's nothing I can do to um, sort of suit everybody. Um, so, but I very much hope that everyone will have something to take away. I'm going to let, start with this slide and the people who've heard me speak before have seen this slide before, but I make no apologies for it. So for a flock to be profitable, we need maximum output from the flock, maximum number of lambs sold at a minimum cost. And we can't always do stuff about our fixed costs, but we can shave our variable costs with efficiencies. Now that's really relevant, even though we're talking about vaccination. When we're talking minimum flock costs, we have to think about this difference between bad vet spend and good vet spend. So there, with the sticky plaster on the bad vet spend, that's anything that needs treating. Anything that's ill or sick or dies and needs a post-mortem, you've got that cost of that disease and it needs a treatment. And I would put antibiotics as a treatment into that bad vet spend. That's where you've got something that's ill and needs treating. And in contrast to that, and preferably on any farm accounts, if you can split out your vet and med into treatment costs and away from good vet spend, which is what you'll your wise investment is, and that might be in your preventative measures. It might be in the um, dose of, that you put on to prevent them getting um, struck by flies um, or vaccination, and that's the topic for this um, webinar. So anything that's preventing animals from getting in in the first place is wise investment, and that's your good vet spend. So maximum output from the flock, we need every ewe to produce as many lambs as possible. Every lamb does count. We need those lambs to be thriving and we need to sell them at the right time. So we need optimum ewe health and optimum lamb health and a robust flock. So a flock that can cope even when conditions are bad. You know, we've had the most horrific um, year so far for weather at lambing followed by drought conditions. Um, we can't do anything about the weather. None of us can. But what we can do is make sure our flocks are robust. So anything that prevents um, disease or issues jeopardising the health and productivity um, is, is necessary for a flock to be robust and cope in difficult times. Moving straight on to vaccination itself. Vaccines work by activating the natural immune response. So, um, and I apologise to anyone who knows this and thinks it's obvious um, but when we have pharma surveys people sometimes are confused with um, the difference between for example an antibiotic which is treating killing the bacteria that are already there in a sick animal with a vaccination which is activating the natural immune response of the animal totally different everything about that is different and I can't I haven't got the time to go into the details but concentrating on vaccines and for this picture here I, oh, I need to thank Stephanie Project Lamb basically an animal the, the first exposure in red um, here as the animal is exposed to the vaccine this I'm not going to go into the detail um, and it, it's not necessary but this is activating the immune response of the animal so we're producing immunoglobulins to help that animal fight the disease. We almost always, particularly the dead vaccine, need to give a second dose because then we get these memory cells and once we've got memory cells we can um, we get a better immune response and we get the production of 
immunoglobulin IgG, which is what we really need. So when that animal then faces a disease, their immune response is primed and they are able to fight it themselves. That, that animal itself has protection and can fight the disease. So, um, you know, we all know as, as we vaccinate children, for example, that's an investment for through their life. But then when they may be vaccinated the baby, once they go to school, they're protected from serious diseases. And it's, it's no different in the animal world. What vaccines do we have available for sheep flocks? Abortion vaccines, clostridial pastorella vaccines, foot rot vaccine, and then the ones at the bottom in the brackets, um, we do have vaccines for other diseases. I'm afraid I haven't got time to cover all those today, um, but I'm going to concentrate on particularly abortion vaccines, the clostridium pastorella and the foot rot vaccine. And believe you me, that's still more than enough for one webinar. So looking at lamb losses, looking at lambing time, we know from data, this is um, Welsh, Welsh data, but um, we know that it's, it's similar around, around the country, that of all um, losses, lamb losses, 30% happen between scanning and lambing, i.e. before that lamb is even born, a third of the losses have occurred, i.e. those are abortions. And then within the UK, um, data from the last six years from the um, APHA disease surveillance, 35% of those abortions are due to enzootic abortion caused by chlamydia. So that's a, by far the most common abortion. And every year, um, virtually every year, that tops the bill. And then 23%, so almost one in, one in four abortions caused by toxoplasmosis. Now, um, I know there'll be people who are listening to this webinar who know all of this and have been vaccinating their sheep forever. However, we know that there are plenty, in fact, more people are not vaccinating than are vaccinating out of the 3.5 million ewes that enter the national flock each year. So those are the replacements that come into our national flock each year. Only a third of them are vaccinated against enzootic abortion and 22%, um, and so between one in four and one in five are vaccinated against toxoplasmosis. Um, I will talk about each disease um, in detail and why I think that we need to do something about those figures. So starting with toxoplasmosis, uh, you can't see the cat very easily here, which is why I've done a, um, an enlargement with her eyes open. Um, cats are the risk for toxo, but it's not as simple as, well, get rid of the cats and you get rid of the problem. So we know that sheep or indeed mice will eat the oocysts, the eggs that are in cat feces, and those eggs might be um, on on feed, on hay, or on the pasture. Now, this cat, actually, as a mature adult cat, that cat is not shedding loads of toxo. It's the young cats, when they very first eat infected mice, they will shed toxoplasma oocysts, and they will only shed them for about a fortnight. And then the only time that an older cat will actually shed is if they're stressed or immunocompromised for any reason, because they're ill, whatever. Um, one little lump of cat feces contains 8 million, sorry, 10 million toxoplasmosis oocysts from an infected cat. So a cat that's shedding, i.e. one of these young cats, when they first start shedding, they will shed absolutely shed loads of oocysts. It only takes 200 oocysts to affect one ewe. So you can see that if this is a young, newly hunting cat, um, one little lump of feces on this bale of straw, that's enough oocysts in that to infect, you know, flocks and flocks of ewes. Um, they're very resistant. Once a cat, once a feces, once you've got utoxu there, they will survive for extremely long periods of time in feed or on pasture. So then the issue is if a pregnant ewe or if the ewe, as she first goes to the tuck, comes across those oocysts, she will either return to the service and end up as a barren ewe, so you end up with with higher numbers of barren mates at scanning, or she will abort, as in the photo, and often you will get mummified fetuses. If she's infected late enough in pregnancy that the lamb actually survives, um, so, you know, often you can get a mummified one and then a very weak lamb, but then that lamb's much more susceptible to diseases and may well not um, survive a long time. Now, we've got quite good studies of toxoplasmosis in the UK, and we know that 76% of UK sheep 
have been exposed to toxoplasmosis in in their lifetime but it's quite up until a year old it's only it's quite a small proportion so you can see the jump from one year to two year that and that's you know that's all to do with management where the sheep are and everything but although by you know by adults um 70 80 percent of sheep have been exposed to toxo um young sheep ewe lambs shearlings it's a much more lower proportion now if these ewe lambs or shearlings see it for the first time when they're pregnant they will go on and either be barren or abort in their first pregnancy and most likely with toxo that's when we see issues it's the shearlings um or the first time lambers who um who have the mummified fetuses or who abort due to toxo this sort of data um which was collected um six seven eight years ago in the UK, it's based on this that I would suggest every lamb, every ewe in the UK ought to be vaccinated before she first goes to the ram because the risks are actually quite high that she will become exposed to toxo. Certainly, three, three quarters um, of sheep are exposed to toxo in their lifetime, and there is a high risk that that will happen in her first pregnancy, so she loses that first lamb. Once you actually diagnose it in a flock, so for example, you've either looked at high barren rates or you've um, sent your uh, percent and everything and fetus to the vets, to the lab to get it tested, um, and we know we've got it in the flock, we don't always suggest vaccinating the whole flock. Often, I would, and, and it's often to do reduce cost. You know, if you're, if you absolutely belt and braces and, and want to do everything, well, absolutely fine do everything that's your most robust but in order to be as cost effective as possible um, often we don't vaccinate the older ewes because they're most likely to already be exposed but I would always suggest on any flock vaccinating your replacements as they come into the flock. So our other big abortion, um, well actually bigger, um, more common is endoscopic abortion in ewes so it's called by chlamydia which affects the placenta. So basically, a necrotic placentitis, the placenta is dying, and it looks like this kind of custody look. A ewe will pick up chlamydia from other ewes as they're shedding it in the lambing shed. When a ewe picks it up, the chlamydia lies dormant until she is next 90 days pregnant. So if she picks it up this year, she looks completely healthy. You don't know she's picked it up. But next year, next lambing time, she will abort. So infection one year means abortion in the following year. So if you diagnose chlamydia this year, you're um, likely to have an issue, more of an issue with it next lambing time. So an infected ewe, um, she'll shed it in her discharges for two weeks. It will live in bedding for about up to six weeks. It's an extremely good reason for if you do have a ewe abort, you get her out of the pen, you isolate her and you remove any evidence of the abortion that's been there. Now we can, um, in the face of an outbreak, so when you diagnose it on a farm, isolate all ewes, as I've already said. Don't foster on breeding ewe lambs because if they pick it up as they're born in the lambing shed, they are then pre-programmed to abort at their first lambing themselves. And, and make sure you keep checking what it is um, just in case you've got other possibilities of abortion around at the same time. Now in the face of an outbreak, it is acceptable to use oxytetracycline, an antibiotic, to prevent damage from the chlamydia that's there. It will reduce losses by hopefully keeping that those fetuses alive, despite the fact the placenta starts to look like this. That dose of um, antibiotics may prolong, um, may allow the fetus to survive long enough to be born. It won't be perfect, but it you hopefully can get a live lamb out of it. But it's only acceptable to use an antibiotic for that in the face of an outbreak or if you had an outbreak in last year. Much better than using antibiotic is to vaccinate the flock in the face of the outbreak with a dead vaccine. You can give the dead vaccine in the face of an outbreak, you can give it to pregnant animals. So as I said right at the beginning, the difference is an antibiotic is killing the bacteria that's there, whereas a vaccination is protecting that animal and allowing the animal, the animal's immune system,
to fight the disease, it's a much better long term way to deal with the disease. So ideally, I um, vaccinate in the face of the outbreak with a dead vaccine. Um, often uh, that's not possible. You're facing the trauma of lambing time. You haven't got time to go through and vaccinate anything. Whatever happens, it's essential you vaccinate your whole flock or at least as many of the flock as you can afford of the younger flock before tapping next year. If, if in this situation, I hate, I hate diagnosing endzoetic abortion because once you diagnose it on a farm, then the issue is there. Then you have got ewes that have already picked up disease. Then you start vaccinating and, you was, and some of those vaccinated animals will still shed and some of those vaccinated animals will still abort the, the following year. So actually with endzootic, it's, it's a diagnosis you really, really don't want because once you diagnose it, it's, it's too late to, you can still vaccinate, but um, you've, you've, already, you've already suffered the losses. So, um, so obviously you vaccinate, um, four weeks before tuffing is the time, um, no sooner to tuffing than that, but so if you haven't vaccinated in the face of the outbreak, you then vaccinate four weeks before tuffing the next year. And bear in mind, if you haven't diagnosed endotic on your flock, um, you know, at this lambing gone or previous lambings, and you think, oh, that's fine, I'm endotic, I'm endotic free. Bear in mind, anyone who buys in ewes is at risk of buying it in on the ewes you buy in, or anyone who has a neighbours that lamb sheep. So even if you breed your own replacements and you think you're pretty safe, if your neighbour is lambing sheep, bear in mind that they might have a placenta that's picked up by a fox or something and carried across to your sheep. You know, there is always a risk of running a completely naive flock that when it comes in, you have a disaster. Um, I would always, because of all that I've said about latent infection and the fact that once you've got it, then you know you, you've got it. You've got it on the farm then, and you're and even though you've got to vaccinate. You're slightly, um, you're slightly coping with a with a bad situation already. I would always say you're of most value vaccinating if you give it to use before they ever encounter disease. So then, what you've got to do is work out with your vets: Am I at risk of buying it in or getting it at any stage? And if I am, I should, I would advise vaccinating your placements as they come into the flock. Um, so and so really. I would suggest all replacement use should be annually vaccinated with endotic. Far, far better to do that for your replacements each year so that in three or four years time, when those replacements have come through the flock, you have a fully vaccinated flock. That's your ideal situation to have vaccinated before you ever get it on as natural infection. Um, if you do have an endotic outbreak, as I spoke on the last slide, then arguably You've got to do the whole flock. Every one of those animals is at risk. It's not the same as toxo where you can think, oh, maybe we can just get away with doing the very younger sheep. If you have an outbreak on the farm, really, you've got to go to that expense of getting the whole flock done and then do your replacements on an annual basis. I'm going to go through this case study, um, which my colleague Philippa put together. So um, this is an indoor lambing, a flock indoor lambing in February, mixed age group use, they buy in yearlings each year. Um, uh, and they buy 50 replacements each year. Usually they scan about 180%. In 2016, scanning was down 20%. So they only scanned at 164. And they had a very high barren rate for that farm. You know, a barren rate of 2% is, is kind of acceptable. I know a lot of people have barren rates of 5%, which is, is too high. Um, but a barren rate of 9% is far too high. That's far too many um, un productive ewes. It was mainly the younger ewes that weren't in lamb. They did a blood sample check on those ewes after scanning and seven out of eight of them were positive for toxo. So they knew they had toxo on that farm. Um, they uh, and then so they on, worked on the scanning rates. They worked out that actually they were expecting only 361 lambs instead of their usual 396 lambs um, for what um, and so you could calculate that basically that higher barren, uh, barren rate meant 35 less lambs G 
due to those ewes just not having lambs in them at scanning time. Now, um, another colleague of mine, Emily, in, has done some work looking at the costs of a lamb at lambing time. So we can either use the cost of the lamb at sale, so say £75 a lamb, and, and obviously that makes that number much higher. Or um, So in this instance here, I've used the cost of a lamb in the lambing shed by the time you've added everything that's gone into the ewe to produce those lambs, um, it's somewhere around £25 per lamb. So that makes those 35 lambs that were not born because of those barren ewes about £900. And then you've got the cost um, of keeping them. Then, same farm, they'd had that problem with the barren mates, they then got six ewes aborted. Ten lambs were lost, further cost, um, abortions at lambing time. And you could have assumed, if you hadn't done further tests, that this was also toxo, the toxo was your only problem. Actually, on this farm, these lambs, um, so usually the AE they abort at two weeks for pregnancy, they tested positive for enzootic. Um, and so he had both issues at once. That's not at all uncommon. And that's why don't just go with your first diagnosis. You might have more than one thing going on at once. But even just at this saying a lamb's only worth £25, um, the total cost of the abortion there was, was £1,152. Um, and arguably, it was much higher um, than that. And certainly, if you looked in terms of lost income from those 45 lambs that weren't there, um, it was more it was more like three thousand pounds. Anyway, that's what abortion costs that farm, and and that's not un, unlikely sort of figures. We often see much much higher levels in abortion cases. So, what does it cost to control it in this flock? So we've said he should be vaccinating them against toxo, and he has to do his replacements each year. We didn't suggest he vaccinated his old ewes because um, we assumed they already immune. We then, as we said, well, you've also got a tox an enzootic issue. So vaccinate everything bought in and vaccinate all your um, older flock as well. Total of about eight, coming on for £900 to vaccinate all replacements for tox and enzo, whole flock for enzo. Um, and then each year he just has to do his replacements each year. So on an annual basis, it's going to cost him 350 quid. But the cost of abortion just that one year was well over a thousand. So, um, and and he never knows if in an unvaccinated flock, you never know when this is going to come. So you're always at risk, particularly if you're buying in use. Um, so it um, it always it always pays to be um, secure, knowing that that you've got the peace of mind that they're protected, rather than face the risk. Of the abortion. Now some people, I want to talk specifically about enzootic because there are some parts of the country particularly where people um, haven't traditionally vaccinated and they have used um, they have used antibiotics to reduce the risk of abortion and th this is, I don't want to go into the details of these numbers but just to say we've crossed it out several times. So enzootic abortion protection by vaccination over a four year period. So this is a case where somebody says, from this point on, I want to protect my entire flock for against Enzo. So he's actually going to the expense of vaccinating his whole flock and his replacement. So this is a sort of scenario of someone who's had an outbreak and then has to vaccinate absolutely everyone, every sheep in the flock. This is good vet spend. It's cost him, it's cost him over a thousand pounds for the whole year but his whole flock is protected for that whole year period. Arguably, if he'd been really clever and vaccinated before he bought it in, then year one would also only be 120 because each year he'd only just do his replacements, do his replacements, do his replacements. So um, it, it would save a significant amount of money if you vaccinate before you've got it. But this is good vet spend. In contrast, and if you are a flock that routinely gives oxytetracycline to the whole flock pre-lambing, um, that is no longer acceptable. But not only is it no longer acceptable for an antibiotic use, it actually doesn't make financial sense either. It's a sticky plaster. It's, um, so the cost of treating a whole flock with oxytetracycline is, 
it's approximately the same as it would be to vaccinate. There's, there's not a lot in it. Um, I'm not going to say it's cheaper to vaccinate. It's, a, it's approximately the same. But we know that the routine use of antibiotics to limit abortion, it is, it is totally unacceptable in today's, um, in today's world. We, we absolutely need to do what we can to prevent unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, so, uh, but, you know, so not, so you, it's not sensible to do from a responsible use of medicine's point of view, but uh, this slide showed you it's neither is it cost effective to do it. Um, the only time it's okay to use antibiotics to limit abortion is if you've had a diagnosed case of enzootic this year or last year. In those circumstances, you have a word with your vet, then it may be appropriate to treat the whole flock with oxytetracycline. And that is okay in the light of, a, of a, a confirmed case. What is not okay is to routinely use antibiotics and to limit abortions. Now, the reason we're labeling this point now is because um, you need to do something about it now rather than wait till next lambing because um, abortion vaccine needs to be given four weeks before an animals go for tuck. So you need to be seriously thinking about this now so you can do something about it before tupping so that you are not caught out at lambing next year. So it, it's really highly topical for um, this time of year. Um, so that's abortion. I'm going to go on to clostridials and pastorella. Now, farmers sometimes say to me, oh, I don't have a problem with clostridia. And what I would say is, if you have soil on your farm, you potentially have a problem with clostridia. Clostridia is everywhere and it's always in soil. Um, and then pastorella will live normally on the tonsils of healthy sheep. And both these diseases cause sudden death. Um, no time to treat them. Prevention is the way forward and prevention basically by vaccination. So this report, um, Sheep and Health and Welfare report, three years from 2011 to 2014, after worms and fluke, pastoralosis and clostridial disease were the next most common diseases um, in sheep of all ages. You know, they're hugely significant um, killers of, of sheep in the UK. Clostridial vaccine, it should be absolutely standard that every year in the country is vaccinated with clostridia, um, clostridial vaccinated and then boosted pre-lambing. So, uh, you know, there are many different types of clostridia and we're not going to go into all the details. You would have heard of pulpy kidney or lamb dysentery um, or tetanus. Um, these diseases are caused by clostridia. The clostridia are in the soil. Every ewe and every ram are at risk. Um, so it should be standard that every animal is, is vaccinated with a clostridial vaccine. So a straight clostridia vaccine like a Bravoxin or a Covexin um, is absolutely essential. And then it may be, you may want to also add the P the pa against pastura pasteurolosis. I'll just quickly talk about pasteurolosis. There are two forms of pasteurolosis. I'm sorry for the, I didn't give you a pre-warning that I was going to put these horrible <laughs> pictures up. Thanks to Ben at, at um, Farm Postmortems. So um, pasteurella, um, classically, most of you will know it as a pneumonia in, in, in lambs or in adult sheep. And this is what you see um, on the lungs uh, post-mortem. But in real life, you'll see a dull animal, high temperatures, breathing, frothing at the mouth. That could easily be a pastoral pneumonia. And then we also have this other sort of pastorella, which causes sudden death. And basically, this is um, the esophagus with ulcers in it. And these are the um, signs as you open up the carcass. Um, pasturella is triggered by stress. So as you gather the animals or a sudden feed change, and that can trigger pasturella. Now, this slide also from Farm Postmortems shows diagnoses of pasturellosis um, through over the years. And you can see we get a little spike May, June time, but almost every year it's September, October, November. And last year, particularly, and, you know, I certainly spoke to a number of store land producers um, 2017, just at the back end last year, with significant pastoral problems. I was of no surprise to see this graph. And, and you know, we did have quite a few pastoral issues last year. But this is a really big risk time. 
so classically we've talked about the risk um, in this in the early summer but actually if you're keeping store lambs this is when you're hugely at risk so in terms of pasturella cover the lambs will get some protection from their mother but it's very short-lived very short-lived for pasturella but nevertheless, lambs that grow quickly and are sold off their mothers may get away without further vaccination. So if you've got single lambs that you've got away, um, they've gone fat to 12 weeks, fine. You may not need to give them any obby back. But any lambs that are still on the farm after the summer, so you saw back on this graph, from September onwards, virtually you need to be thinking about it now because the peak is going to be coming up within the next month. Any lambs that are still on the farm after the summer are at particularly high risk. Now, those lambs absolutely need two doses. So if you're going to give those lambs Ovivac, so that's got Clostridia, you know, protecting against the pulp of kidney, etc., and Pasteurel in it, they need two doses. And we estimate that probably a third of farmers um, only give one dose and think that's enough for Ovivac. Quite frankly, you're wasting your time. You know, that graph I showed at the beginning um, with you give a dose, it primes it and you give the second dose. You absolutely need to do that if you're giving Olivac P. If, if you, um, there is also the Pasturella alone, Ovipast, which also if you're particularly high risk of Pasturella and you've, um, you've done your lambs earlier in the summer, so you've had your two doses and you're worried about that spike, September, October, November, I would seriously consider giving a third dose of Ovipast to lambs in September, October time to protect those store lambs as they go through the through the back end. Um, so there is a whiz through Clostridium pastorella, but um, I think it's about 42% of eligible animals are given pastorella clostridial vaccines. Um, so pastorella, it does depend on the risk and situation of your sheep. But clostridials particularly, it's fundamental that every adult sheep should be clostridial vaccinated. So arguably, the uptake of vaccines should be much higher than it, it actually is. Right. In the spirit of moving swiftly on, um, oh, that's a summary of all your, your pastoral and clostridials. Moving swiftly on, I just want to talk very quickly about footbacks. And we have got another webinar in a month or two time specifically at lameness. So I won't dwell on lameness. But... Lameness is the major reason that sheep farmers use antibiotics. And you can see from this graph, oxytocycline main thing used for lameness. And right through the year, we have um, quite a significant use of oxytetracycline um, used by sheep farmers. And that's particularly for lame sheep. Now, you would have all seen this picture before, the five point plan. You need to avoid the spread of infection. You need to catch and treat individuals quickly and effectively if they're lame. You need to cull out persistent effectors, offenders. You need to quarantine boarding sheep. And all these are really, really important. But the fifth point is to vaccinate against foot rot. And it's a vaccine that people don't always understand. So I will, in the spirit of vaccination, I always throw it. Um, we think probably about 16% of eligible sheep get foot vax. Um, and a couple of surveys have sort of suggested that. Um, we know that uh, foot vax is associated with a reduction in prevalence. And interestingly, this study that they did at Liverpool on this large group of lambs, which were infected both by foot rot and CODD, contagious ovine digital dermatitis, they found the vaccine was effective at about 62%. So not it's not 100%, and I have to say no vaccine is 100%, um, but it was effective against foot vax, and, but also against CODD, so contagious ovine digital dermatitis, even though that's not in the vaccine, if you sort out your foot rot, you will also, um, to some degree, sort out CODD. Far more than the data from trials is foot vax is the one vaccine that time and time again, in speaking to farmers, doing farmers workshops, is the vaccine that, that people see a clinical difference on farm. And um, it's not a perfect vaccine. It's not that easy to use, but so many people who have been struggling with lame sheep have told me that they've started off using, you know, they've used foot backs and have managed to get things under control. Um, but it's, um, 
you know, it's not brilliant, but it seems to just increase the margin of error enough, that margin of safety enough that that people finally get better control with lameness on the farm. So how to use it, and it is complicated, and you do want to discuss it with your vet, and the best time depends on your own farm and your major risk time. So some people, the major risk time is in the back end when the grass is long. Some people, mainly, is when they've got ewes and lambs at foot um, in the spring and they need to give a dose before then. I would usually advise people do do it twice in the first year. Um, certainly, the data sheet suggests two doses six weeks apart to start off with. We don't always have to do this one with two doses right at the beginning, although I would suggest people do use it twice in the first year. Um, but you have to use it with care. So you do get some swelling, you get colouring of the wool. Um, one of the ways you can help this is to warm the bottle to body temperature. Just, you know, hold it. Don't put it straight from the fridge before you inject it. Make sure you've definitely got a clean needle and that you've definitely taken time to do it. Don't do it as a rush job or do it when all the sheep are wet or anything like that. You're bound to have issues with it. Um, and then uh, just make sure if they're vaccinated with foot vax that um, it, it can cause reactions with a moxtec to one percent. So Cydectin or Cermex 1% should not be given to sheep that have been given footbacks. But so it's not it's not fantastically easy to use, um, but often people find it's worth it. Now I've put this together as a suggested plan for the vaccination of replacement use. And basically um, we're going down to tapping, scanning, lambing time. And that's because at this time of year we've got to fit a lot in. Now anything that's not already on the clostridial system needs two jabs for six weeks apart but i would argue that this is probably not your highest priority now hopefully you've already done it you sorted them out early in the summer if not you may not be able to fit this in now and we might have to do something um down here what you absolutely do need to do now and well before four weeks for tuffing is sort your abortion vaccines for your replacement use um, you can give both toxo um, and enzymatic abortion vaccine at the same time, obviously not mixed, but at two different sites of the sheep, and it's, but it's got to be at least four weeks before tuffing. But it's okay to do those two together on the same day. So that's toxo and enzo, or toxo and seva, but the enzo the enzootic abortion vaccine. That's got to be four weeks before tuffing. And you don't want to give anything else at the same time. The live vaccines, you just want to do those vaccines. Don't do foot vax at the same time as abortion, but you can do it two weeks later. So you could squeeze in a foot vax between the abortion vaccine and tupping in the middle there. Once the ewes have gone to the tub, do not do anything with them for six weeks. Keep them on a steady pain of nutrition. Do not stress them or move them more than you have to. This is a really important time for letting embryos implant. But by the time you get to scanning, um, mid-pregnancy, actually things are pretty secure then. And that's another good time for foot back. So um, if you don't think your big problem with lame sheep is here, or if you can't fit this in, then mid-pregnancy is a good time to give a foot back, either when you scan them or perhaps when you house them. And we do see an increase in, in lameness spread at housing. So, so that's not a bad time. And then absolutely, You've got to give a clostridia booster to the ewes three to four weeks before the start of lambing. So this, you're giving it to the ewes. The ewes need to react to the vaccine booster and, and then make colostrum. It's got to be three to four weeks before the start of lambing. Um, now, if you don't think these ewes have properly had their two jabs up here, then give your booster three to four weeks before lambing. And give, but make sure you gave the. You've got to. You've got to set them up first. You can't just give a dose to use that didn't have the primary course. So it may be that you need to give them. Um, you need to give the first dose eight weeks before lambing and the second dose um, four weeks before lambing. Lambing time. Nobody really wants to be um, vaccinating. You, know, you shouldn't be using foot vax um, within four weeks of lambing anyway. But by the time you're weaning. Um, that is again a good time for foot backs if you if you need to give foot backs. Um, obviously, speak to your vets where you can fit it in, but that's a sort of general, generic plan. But you do need to talk to somebody and sort it out for your particular farm. 
Well, I can vaccine be disappointing, and it can be. It can be because the animal. We should be giving vaccines to to fit healthy animals. So um, if they're poorly fed, or if they've got some other disease, or if they're particularly stressed, the vaccine might be disappointing. And then we've also got they might be particularly stressed for the weather conditions, um, things going on, and so anything that isn't 100 percent either when they're vaccinated or as their primary immune response or when they face disease any stress stress at any one of those times may mean vaccination doesn't work quite as you expected but you also have to say do you honestly play by the rules so we don't have a huge amount of data from sheep farms but we know from cattle farms we and and I'm quite sure you know plenty of sheep farms they're all they're also the cattle farms, but um, for cattle we know a third of farmers never looked at the data sheet so didn't even look at what the rules were. 21% either used the wrong dose or the or the wrong route. 14% um, vaccinated the animals too young, and and nearly half of them used an incorrect interval between the first and second dose. You know all of those are reasons why the vaccine might not be might not work. The data sheet, I know the print is really small and I know it's quite a lot to wade through, but it really is important. That's what the, the companies know that's how the vaccine works best and you really are recommended to follow the data sheet. Um, certainly, uh, in a, out, the 44 outbreaks of pastoralosis um, taken by Ben at the Paul Sock Centre, 39% of those animals had either not been vaccinated or they didn't know they were unrecorded. 61% apparently the vaccines, the animals had been vaccinated, but then when they drilled into it, actually 26% had not been vaccinated correctly, and a further 30% had some other concurrent disease or stress, which could indicate why the vaccine didn't work. So we do see vaccine breakdowns, probably with pasteurellosis more than any of the others that I've talked about. Although, you know, I've already said vaccines are not 100% but they're a lot, lot better than not doing it. Um, so, you know, it, it is worth making sure you're doing it, doing it right. Um, and, and that also means don't leave open bottles. Make sure once you mix it up, you use it as soon as you should. So if you, once you open a bottle um, and it says use it within eight hours, you do want to use it within eight hours because otherwise, potentially, you've got issues with that bottle. It's either contaminated because you've introduced bugs. So, you know, the worst thing you could do is take a needle out of the bottle, put it into the animal, put the needle back into the bottle. You're then introducing um, bacteria back into the bottle, which could affect the vaccine or it could affect the adjuvant, the carrier that is making sure that that vaccine is responded to by the immune system. And then with a the live vaccine. So, for example, uh, Toxivax or the en some of the enzootic abortion vaccines. Um, those live vaccines, once they're made up, they, the, uh, the organism will die within the, period, the short period of time. So if you uh, keep using it, you, you're, not, you're not doing what you, what you should um, and it, you have no expectation that it will work as it should. So you really do want to, to make sure you follow the instructions and you respect each bottle of vaccine. And you also want to think seriously about your farm fridge. So your fridge should be between two and eight degrees. So, and they did this recent study down in the southwest where they looked at farm fridges. And so this then, and what they had, they had data track bloggers, temperature inside the fridge, temperature outside the fridge. Um, and the basically the yellow line that's outside the fridge, that was um, environmental temperature. This fridge, the temperature inside the fridge was exactly the same as the temperature outside the fridge. There was no fridge going on there. It was just exactly the same as the outside temperature, totally useless. And for a vaccine to need to get between two and eight, you could see for a long period of time during the summer, it was too hot. It, in contrast, in this fridge, where this is the outside temperature, uh, the fridge was consistently freezing the vaccine. Um, so, uh, you know, 59% had recording above the top temperature. 53% had recording below two degrees um, and 41% had at least one recording at or below zero. Zero is really important. Just go on to here. Oh, all the fridges, none of the fridges maintain the correct temperature throughout the study. But this 
Matt's comment here about freezing. Um, it's really, really, really important that vaccines, particularly these vaccines, but I'm sure there are others, these are just ones I found going through the data sheets, these are made up. The reason these vaccines work is because they're bonded to some, an aluminium adjuvant. If you freeze that, the bond breaks and the vaccine is useless. So it, you must make sure that you're not by mistake freezing the vaccine. It doesn't, um, it doesn't do any good and it actually makes it useless. Um, so please do bear that in mind. Um, you know, it's a huge investment in vaccination. Don't waste it by a fridge that's um, then ruined it. And actually the cold chain from when you collect it from the vet surgery, take it home, make sure you've got it in a cool bag, um, ice packs, but make sure the vaccine is protected from the ice pack. So the ice pack does not freeze the vaccine on the way home. Um, so a towel or something between the ice pack and the vaccine. Um, and put it in the fridge, but make sure your fridge is not neither too hot nor too cold. Right, that's me, Katie. Have we got any questions? Right, thank you very much, Fiona. Um, we have a few questions come in, but just to remind you, if you want to ask a question, then type it in the question panel on the right hand side of the panel. Um, and just to remind you all that the webinar has been recorded and will be available on YouTube um, as soon as we can get it turned around. So probably the end of the week or the beginning of next. And for any of the vets listening, if you'd like the presentation to um, deliver to clients of your own um, to to producers then if you email brp at ahdb.org.uk um, we'll be able to send that through to you. Right so the first question is oh there's lots of questions they've just flooded in. Um, can cats be vaccinated for toxo? No cats can't be um, but basically if you have an old mature cat on the farm that's going to the big risk is Cats having kittens, it's a kittens, as they first um, become adolescent is a risk. A mature adult cat is not a risk, not a problem. Do not shoot all the cats. Keep mature, healthy cats on the farm. That's, that's your ideal. Okay, thank you. Um, should we be vaccinated news for abortion in an outdoor lambing situation? Uh, well, you're not, it depends where you're buying a use in from. So if uh, any you, you buy in is at, at risk. Uh, there's less spread outdoors because there's less chance of them coming across the placenta and eating it, but there's still is there's not no chance. So toxo, you know, they will pick they can pick it up outdoors as much as indoors. Enzo, the risk of spread is less, but it's not zero. Okay. Um if you're given you lambs uh, two clostridial vaccines finishing in June, would you say they need a pre-lambing booster if lambing in uh, September? These are out of lambing um, sheep. Um, no, uh, um, not, not necessary. So we say with the pre-lambing, the clostridial vaccine pre-lambing, we say, yes, it should be three to four um, weeks before lambing and I suppose but I suppose ideally you give them another dose but they sh their immune system should be fine the key there is not to give it too soon to lambing you're okay a bit further back that's a that's a fine line that one I and I wouldn't I would um I suppose belt and braces I would give them another dose before lambing but it's not absolutely essential. Their immune system has reacted. They're well with well within, um, certainly for clostridial. But perhaps I would, if I was worried about pastorella, I would I would definitely give them another one for pastorella. Not necessary for clostridia. Okay, thank you. Um, when vaccinating new lambs for abortion, you say four weeks pre-tupping, um, but can it be given a lot longer than that pre-tupping? So if they've got the new lambs ready now, could they be done now? Yeah, but, uh, from five months, uh, you can give it. So uh, the, the minimum is four weeks pre-tupping. But if you've got them ready now, you can give them now. That's absolutely not a problem. Best to get it done out of the way. The, the only issue is ordering the vaccine. They, only, they produce it at a certain time. So speak to your vet about, um, you know, ordering it when you're doing it. But that's not a problem. 
Okay, um, this person says the ewes usually have six crops of lambs. Um, do they need to vaccinate for toxo and enzo after three crops or will one vaccination cover them for life? Okay, so officially, as far as the data sheet goes, that it's uh, two, three years. I I almost never need to give a second dose. So if people are doing their replacements as they come into the flock. Um, and we've got a low risk. You're, that that's also a slightly debatable one. So by the book answer would be yes. I would probably boost it again at three years. But actually, practically speaking, you would probably get away with it if you've had a vaccine. If all your younger sheep are well vaccinated, um, clinically you you may not have to. So that would be a decision on value of individual ewes and lambs, but that would be a discussion to have with your vet. It's not a clear cut, yes or no. Okay, um, can you just clarify the advice um, on the action the following year um, after diagnosis of enzootic abortion? Would you vaccinate and inject with, anti uh, with oxytetracycline or just vaccinate if you have time? If you've diagnosed a, a enzootic abortion, I would definitely vaccinate for the next year, but if I'm only vaccinating, I would still expect there to be some abortions next year if I had a problem this year. Though there would only be half that there would be if I hadn't vaccinated, but there would still be some. So if you're if you're not prepared for there to be still some abortions, then I would also give oxytetracycline. So that's three to six weeks for lambing in the second year. So again, that's a discussion to have with your vet and um, so definitely vaccinate, but you might want to give antibiotic as well. OK, um, should you also vaccinate your tups for uh, toxo and uh, chlamydia abortion? No, you just have to do the use. OK, um, I use foot vax as per the instructions on dry sheep, but still get lumps on quite a few sheep. Are there any tips to prevent this? Well, the only tips I've got, and I'm, uh, and this is not totally evidence based, but I would say so, warming it to room temperature before it's injected. Also, be very careful where you're injecting it. So, some people talk about trying to to give it into a flap of skin where there's not a huge amount of muscle movement. So, you know, not immediately behind the leg or where there's it's going to be um, there's a lot of movement that can make it. A bit of an issue, so um, yeah, clean, clean and dry, and um, carefully administered is um, the best you can do. the The advice is to give it in the neck, behind the ear, where there's not a huge amount of movement, but you've got to be really careful that in a thin sheet that you don't go too close to the spinal cord. So you make sure you definitely are just subcutaneous but just a couple of inches behind the ear, not where the leg is moving um, to irritate it. OK, thank you. Um, are continental breeds more susceptible to pasteurisis than native breeds? Well, that's an interesting question. What we do know, or we, we're getting more evidence, is that fast growing animals that are very fast growing um, are potentially more susceptible to disease than um, so pot potentially there might be there might be something in there not necessarily I mean there's always some sort of genetic component they did a study in New Zealand um, last 2017 so last year and they showed heritability uh, well they, they showed there was some heritability um, so there could be a difference but to be honest um, whether that's enough of a difference to say that you're safe, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. You'd ha you'd have to have animals under exactly the same conditions to measure that clearly. But I wouldn't say that's a ridiculous thing to suggest. Okay. Um, in May June, use Heptavac P for potential breeding females and Baroxin for the remainder. Would you still vaccinate the non-breeding uh, lambs with the P vaccine if still on the farm after August? And intending to finish them by the end of the year? Well, that graph of pasteurosis outbreaks, 
showed that um, you know October, November, December is your high risk for, for pasturella. Um, so it depends a bit on your management. Then, if you're going to bring them in and suddenly change their food, or if they're um, housed with poor ventilation or whatever, then they are more at risk of pasturella. Or if they're outside and the weather changes suddenly, all those things can trigger pasturella. And the thing with pasturella is it's a normal commensal on tonsil, so we see it on normally healthy sheep. But then it's those stressors that means it gets known and can damage them. So I would say if you've got animals that are still on the farm by December, that they, I would suggest they should have had a pasturella, double pasturella vaccine. Okay, um, if vaccinating lambs with Ovivac P and then selecting them to use as replacements, should they then be started on Heptavac P with a double dose or can they just have a single dose of Heptavac P before lambing? No, they definitely need a double dose of Heptavac P because the Ovivac's only got four components in. The if you, if you only gave the single Heptavac booster, then you wouldn't have had the primary course for those crucial, the element, it means that the lambs born to those ewes would not be protected from things like lamb dysentery. And we're primary reason for vaccinating ewes just for lambing is to protect their lambs from getting lamb dysentery. And that's hideous disease when you see it. So definitely did two hectovax. Okay, if you vaccinate ewe lambs in their first year, i.e. July, August, and don't get them in lamb in the first year, can you get away with only giving them a booster four weeks before they lamb as a two-year-old, or do they need one in between? They need one in between. So if you've given them the primary course, and then you've gone more than 12 months, at some once you get to 12 months, you've got to give them that. So even if they don't lamb the next year, I would give them a booster at the same time as when you do all the ones that are lambing, so that then you take them around a whole other year to them being shearlings, they they did have a, a booster. If you don't do that, you've you've um, you're kind of going to have to set them up again on a double primary course if you've gone more than the year. Okay, um, another one. Uh, I've read somewhere that not about not giving antibiotics. Um, i.e. for lame sheep alongside vaccinations as it will fight the vaccine rather than letting the immune system fight it. Is that true or are you allowed to give elamycin, uh, for example, alongside footbacks? Okay, alongside footbacks, you're absolutely okay giving an antibiotic. So the footbacks um, vac vaccination is just against, uh, it's got little bits of the foot rot bug in the vaccine and giving an antibiotic at the same time is no problem at all. In fact, I'd recommend it if you're giving foot vax to, at the same time, definitely alamycin or, or whatever antibiotic to lame sheep in that group, but foot vax and, and give the antibiotic to the lame ones. The one that you must not give uh, oxytetracycline, alamycin, endomycin, whatever, at the same time is the Enzovax or the CVAC um, chlamydia vaccine. So those those um, abortion vaccines, that's their live chlamydia vaccines, they must not be given at the same time as an antibiotic. But foot vax, that's okay. Okay, um, one is, this is probably more of a statement really, but isn't it cheaper to have an indicator sticker to show if the temperature has been breached rather than obviously having a vaccine ruined by a, a bad fridge? Um, Definitely. <laughs> Um, and what sort of length of coverage would you expect from Pasteurella vaccine if trying to uh, plan to ensure coverage for the known risk or stress factors? Well, the Pasteurella bit of the vaccine is the least. So generally, a vaccine um, lasts, like the Clostridia ones, lasts really nicely for a year once you've given the primary course. Pasteurella isn't quite as good as that, and it will only last for three, four months. So arguably, that's why I'd suggest a third dose potentially in September, October time, because sometimes we wonder if lambs have been pastorella vaccinated early in their life, that it's actually waned by the time you get that really high risk in the back end. And so, yeah, you're, you're really looking at about three months, three to four months for pastorella cover. 
Okay, um, and I think the final question, how long do oocysts survive in the environment? You said a long time, but is that months or is it years? Years, I'm afraid. They're really robust. They're really solid shell on them. And so um, potentially uh, it could be years. So that's so even if it's a cat fetus that's sort of been dried out, sort of sprinkled through, those oocysts could, could continue to be a risk for for young sheep for for years. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you for listening to everybody. We've had a great turnout uh, this evening, and thank you again, Fiona, for sharing your expertise with us this evening. I'm sure everybody has um, learned at least a couple of um, pointers to either take back to their clients or to put in place on their farm. Uh, just a reminder, if you would like the presentation to deliver to your own producers for those vets out there, then please email brp at ahdb.org.uk um, and the webinar rec recording will be emailed um, over the next few days once it's been um, sorted out and finalised. Thank you very much for listening. Have a lovely evening.